next up, we're very fortunate to have uh, Ty Pemberton and Jennifer Sullivan from uh, USC to discuss uh, a, a specific application with uh, digitizing film. Uh, Ty, Ty Pemberton is the digital imaging manager for the USC Digital Library. He holds an MFA from Columbia and a MLIS from Syracuse University and uh, was a co-founder of the Werewolf House Film Production Company. Um, over the past uh, 20 years, he has worked on digitizing and cataloging items from the California Historical Society, Columbia University Seminars, and Frank L. Tenenbaum Collections, the Los Angeles Examiner, One Magazine, uh, Mattachine Society, and the Department of Defense. Jennifer Sullivan brings to the table 21, 21 years of experience imaging cultural heritage materials. As a digital imaging specialist with the USC Digital Library, she currently works on the DIMMOC, D-I-M-O-C project, digitizing aerial film and Arlington, and Arlington National Cemetery ledgers. Other projects include digitizing USC's One Archive LGBTQ poster collection and independent Webster Commission records relating to the LA riots of 1992. Jennifer cut her teeth as a special projects photographer at the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens, where she gained experience digitizing medieval manuscripts, rare books, photographs, glass plates, nitrate, panorama negatives, and lots of ephemera. Lots of, I'm sorry, excuse me, lots of uh, ephemera. I never planned on being a collections photographer. I plan to document the world as a photojournalist, but I have to say, I love what I do. The historic materials I get and handle and see are absolutely amazing. I find the challenge of figuring out, figuring out how to digitize varied or fragile materials just plain fun. Frustr frustrating sometimes, but fun. Well, Ty and Jennifer, please turn your, your cameras on. Um, and um, Carson, let's load up their presentation. All right, so I'm going to hand hand the mic over to you both and let you go. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. All right. Yes, thank you, Peter. Hi, everybody. Can you hear us all? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Uh, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, a project that is currently ongoing. Uh, it takes up a lot of our time here in the USC Digital Lab. Uh, which is our aerial film digitization subproject within the DIMOC or DOD contract that the USC Digital Library is currently uh, operating on. Uh, so just a quick overview, uh, who are we? Uh, so we largely support the mission of the USC Libraries to actively um, kind of bolster discovery creation, preservation of knowledge and develop collections and services that support and encourage the academic endeavors of faculty, students and staff. Um, and as I think is probably evidenced by uh, Jen's bio and my bio, uh, the USC Digital Library represents a variety uh, of format types. So we're talking illuminated manuscripts, maps, photographs, posters, prints, rare illustrated books, audio and video recordings, um, you know, covering topics such as arts, history, performing arts, social sciences, applied sciences, fine and decorative arts. Um, and uh, in the USC Digital Library, we have over 1.2 million files across 72 collections uh, with over 30 contributors worldwide. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, um, we have our digitization activity is driven by a number of factors. So we're driven by grants, institutional initiatives, patron requests uh, for items within the USC collections and commercial contracts, which is what we'll be talking about today. All right, so the project materials. Uh, we at the USC Digital Library are currently working on a digitization contract with the Department of Defense. And a large portion of that uh, involves digitizing uh, Army Corps of Engineer aerial film. Uh, the picture there on the slide is of one of the larger reels that we have 
Uh, there are a number of copy reels in the collection that copy um, largely nitrate film uh, from previous reels uh, onto a more stable film stock. Um, by our best estimation of what we've received, uh, there are over 770,000 frames from approximately 3,000 reels. Um, of, I say on the slide here, nine by 10 inch aerial negatives, the frames themselves of exposure uh, are nine by nine, uh, but we're also capturing the instruments and very often there's written errata in between frames. And so we've expanded that frame a little bit. Um, and it's part of a five year digitization contract. Um, just to give you some additional background on that, um, the average size per reel is 350 frames, but with the copy reels that can go in excess of 500. Um, and in the boxes that have been delivered to us, we have about two to five reels per box for an average of about 1100 frames per box. Um, at our current rate of digitization, full, digi full completion of the project will take about three years. Yeah. All right. Um, do you have anything you want to add to that slide, Jen? Just that five years is job security. Yes. It's nice. It is. It's rare in this in, in this uh, this career. <laughs> yes. So. Um, and so another thing worth mentioning here is the 770,000 frames. That's almost as many images as are in the entire collection of the USCDL. Yeah. Uh, and so it's quite the undertaking. And so as we move forward and we kind of talk about the project specs uh, and why we uh, worked with Digital Transitions to develop the DT Real Top for this project, um, it'll become apparent why we made some of our choices um, versus kind of pursuing higher resolutions at kind of a slower production rate. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the next reel. So here are our project specs. 900 PPI, Adobe RGB. This, a lot of this is not going to surprise anybody that's used to digitizing negatives uh, to FADGI standards. 16-bit. Uh, and uh, the average file size uh, at these specifications is wow. 500 megabytes. Um, sometimes they're a little less. They very rarely exceed that. And if they do, it's only by 10, 15 megabytes. Um, 900 PPI puts us kind of right on the edge of hitting FADGI 2-star. Uh, for negatives over four by five. Um, if we move on to the next, here, let me, if I jump ahead a little bit, uh, our friends at UCSB uh, had a similar project. And as you can see on the very top left image here, um, they were using flatbed scanners and feeding through that way. And obviously with a flatbed scanner, you can get higher resolutions than generally you can with camera capture right now with the sensors that are available. Uh, but of course it's slower and we have a lot of materials in the collection that we're working on right now that are very damaged and very crispy and some of which we really, really can't sandwich between panes of glass or within a flatbed scanner um, for fear of just shattering them to pieces. So let me go back a little bit. Uh, so the image on the right is pretty representative of the collection as a whole. Uh, you'll see the instruments on the left-hand side there. Uh, there's a date, uh, there's an altitude, um, there's a job number, and there's both in the top left corner and the bottom right corner, uh, there's a frame counter and an exposure counter. Um, and they don't always match up. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, in a little bit later. Uh, if we want to get a sense of what 900 PPI gets you, uh, this is obviously not going to be perfect because it's in a PowerPoint presentation. But uh, one of the things we really focus on is the instrumentation in these. And so this is just a detail shot um, zoomed in about 200%. Uh, and so you can see that you can really, really read kind of a lot of the fine details on the instrumentation. I can actually press in a little bit further than this. Um, but when you press in further than this, it does start to kind of blow out the edge detail and you can start to see some of the pixelation. Um, let's see. So a note about the Adobe RGB output that we chose. Um, one of the reasons we chose to output is Adobe RGB, even though most of these images are in black and white, uh, is that a lot of the annotations are in color. Some of the tape mm -hmm. is colored and indicates kind of specific things being blocked out. We didn't want to lose that information. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, 
where we're encountering film damage or degradation of the film base, it's good to have that extra information in case you want to do additional pushing of contrast to kind of bring out the detail that matters and kind of reduce the damage. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had to do a lot of that yet, but it's good to have that information there. Uh, let's see. Um, I'd also like to mention that uh, Jen is co-presenting with me here, not only because she's an excellent resource and a wonder, one, wonderful, wonderful technical partner to have on this project, uh, but she was with us from the very, very beginning of the project. We now have two full-time employees and two part-time employees. Uh, Jen is a full-time employee that spends part of her time working with us on this. She used to spend all of her time working with us on this. Uh, but as we progress, you will see that uh, while we were uh, hotly anticipating um, our fully completed DT real top. Uh, we kit bashed a few things together um, to kind of, we received pressure to start the project early while we were waiting. Uh, we kit bashed a few things together. So Jen is our digital imaging specialist who has experience both on the kind of apparatuses that we built ourselves out of kind of trash and the high end and the low end. <laughs> exactly. So she has experienced both of what it's like to work on the real top, which is purpose built for this. Yeah. And on the things that we kind of figured out Wiley Coyote style on the back end. Yeah. All right. So evolving approaches. I already talked about uh, the approach uh, from our friends at UCSB uh, in the center there. Uh, that was our second version of our first kit bash. The only difference uh, you'll notice there in the center. Um, all of these rigs that are used by USC, uh, they all require uh, an atom station with at least the DT film top uh, in order to function. Um, you'll notice that uh, the cameras on both of these that we're getting the 900 PPI out of, and we're really squeezing it. Um, mm -hmm. We have the IXGs um, on the number two and the one operating the real top. And uh, we recently purchased the new camera. So we have the IXH on the kit bash v2 which will eventually upgrade to another real top uh the only real difference between the kit bash v1 and the version 1.2 is that you'll notice that we have some kind of industrial those two blue holders there industrial uh coax reels uh for taking up cable um and i'll show you a detail shot on that later to show you just one of the many reasons that building it yourself is not ideal um and then, of course, on the kit bash version two, uh, we have uh, the LED photon as the light source in the kit bash version version one, just based off of the supplies that are at hand. We actually have a GTI light box underneath, which provides a lot less illumination. Uh, we don't really have the same latitude we have on the other two machines. Uh, and then, of course, on the bottom uh, is the atom with the real top. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Uh, let me just make sure that, uh, so some of the concerns when we started kit bashing things and the concerns we talked about with DT and, and Carl Wolchewski in partnering to get this designed and built uh, is basically the real hardware uh, that is an integral part of how the film is wound, uh, illumination, uh, slack and take up, mm -hmm. operational ease, registration of the film itself. Uh, and basically material preservation and tolerances, especially uh, important. I have a little story to tell y'all as we move forward about a problem reel that I dealt with just yesterday uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. Anything to add, Jen, before we move on? Stop me at any point. I tend to talk faster and faster, Jen. You know how that goes. <laughs> no, I can just say that um, I've used two of these rigs and yeah, the the real top is so much smoother and easier than the other ones. It, we're going to talk about those things, but um, you know, it it just made life easier and it sped everything up. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And with the in regards to the camera, it's at we are basically going full frame, edge to edge on the sensor or it, uh -huh. the, the frame. Um, so basically anything that's crooked, anything that is a little off shows immediately. So that's one reason why um, we really need to have um, everything aligned properly. The film, the camera, the lights, everything. So. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and so I've moved on to the next slide, which was our previous creative solutions. And we're still using these on our rigs uh, that do not currently have the real top. And we'll come back and talk about some of the detail on this in comparison. Uh, but a couple of things that we have is we have a cleaning cloth here on the left. A lot of these, um, pretty much all of this um, that is attached to the DT film top, uh, we credit Jen with. Jen really figured out how to make things work um, while the real top was in production. Uh, so we got a cleaning cloth on the left. Um, we've got, uh, you can't really see them here, but there are, if you look on the far left and right hand sides, uh, like right under where it says Tyvek tape, uh, Jen originally started using trimmed ID holders to help um, guide registration for the film. Uh, yeah. The film on our homemade rigs really like to shimmy a little bit. You'll get- Yeah, the rigs aren't sized correctly. So the film, the reel would slide. So we had to lock it down, but it would only slide so far. And uh, and the cleaning cloth is because this film is dirty. It sure is. Very dirty. Yeah. And very, very dirty. Um, and of course the Tyvek tape, um, and you'll see what the solution is on the real top in a bit uh, that replaces the Tyvek tape um, with a far superior result. Um, and of course the industrial spool, uh, we currently found a better set of industrial spools that we can kind of use for take up without having to cannibalize one of our very precious um, actual mm -hmm. aerial film spools. Uh, this spool itself was machined by DT um, to be an analog to the spools that were actually being used at the time. Um, but these are, you know, good luck. A lot of this old hardware is precious and hard to come by. If you remember from a few slides, Say that again. And it's dented. A lot of it's yes, really and it's, up. And it's dented. And if I'm not mistaken, our friends at UCSB, you may remember that image from a slide or two ago. Uh, their take up and um, re-reel hardware was taking off, taken off of a number of viewing tables that have been produced in, I think, pop between the, the 40s and the 60s. Yeah. Um, it, everything is kind of cannibalized to make this work, unless you're working with DT, where they'll custom machine parts for you so you can work smoothly. Yeah, I, I searched far and wide across the internet looking for until we had the while we were waiting for something that I could use as a reel and I could not find anything. Mm -hmm. So it, we had to come up with something and um, you know, it works. It, it works but the job, but it's not it's not ideal. Yeah, and we'll talk about some of the, the downsides of it. it yeah it working, but not working optimally. Uh, and so uh, we have ongoing creative solutions that are maintained. So even on the real top, we've maintained a little bit of the ID, plas uh, ID plastic and the Tyvek uh, just to increase the stability of the registration. Um, another problem with this project is that when we received our reels, there's no inventory of the individual frames yeah. uh, on each reel. So we don't know how many frames are gonna be on each reel um and so qc and making sure that we have a complete capture with every reel um would be very very time consuming and really basically make the project impossible if we had or require an army yeah of, and the number uh, the numbering is not always consistent on the reels even the counties yes. um the counties yeah. are more consistent which is why we chose to use those as our numbers as opposed to the imprinted uh frame number that they put on after the fact so basically we just, any on the shoot sheets, basically we just note the first counter number and then, you know, we're able, and then anytime there's a change, we note the counter number. And then we're also able to, um, I go by tens and every 10, I double check that the counters in, is in the correct sequence. Like if I started at counter 23, number 10 should be at counter 33. So that I'm able to know that I got everything. And then the person doing post, is able to look at that if they notice something is off. Like if something jumps from 33 to 36 and they're like, uh-oh, are we missing something? They can look at the shoot sheet and go, oh no, they're miss they're not there. It's also a uh, CYA for in the future if the DOD ever comes back and says, hey, we're missing this. And we've got, no, we are not. <laughs> No. Precisely. And, I, you know, I've asked the other imaging specialists on the project to also check by tens as they capture, because obviously when you're talking 500 frames on a reel, yeah. um, 
you miss something and it's time to recapture reloading the reel and then and then advancing uh to the frame that's been missed right that's a huge time sink so it's much better to to catch something that you've missed during capture uh than it is uh it's also to easier to to reload if you have to because i have on the uh, dt the, mm -hmm. the real, real oh, yeah it's, old one. it's much easier to much easier. Uh, to load there's a lot of and there's forks that the other ones have that the DT has taken care of. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what does the real top actually look like? That's the real top there on the right. Uh, and so there are a number of pieces here. Um, some of the things that are a major improvement over kind of kit bashing something yourself is both of those reels on the left and right are removable uh, mm -hmm. and advanceable, which um, you know, basically homebrew rigs are not uh, that glass the top glass in the center uh, its height is adjustable both on the back and the front and so we can put as light or as firm a pressure on the film as we need um, obviously those two reels are perfectly aligned with one another and so registration and kind of the evenness of the advance doesn't really shimmy as much they still shimmy a little bit on the reels themselves and there's really nothing you can do about that um because it's the nature of how the film was loaded on the reel that you've gotten itself yeah um you'll notice you'll notice also those tensioner reels um on either side uh those are individually adjustable so you can increase or decrease pressure and down pressure on the reel something that's mm -hmm. worth noting here uh is a lot of the film that we'll get um it tends to want to curl in the direction of the emulsion which probably won't surprise any photographers here uh, and so we can counteract a lot of that um, by shooting emulsion up uh, and then just flipping the image uh, in post. Um, Which I do not have to do on the reel to reel. Exactly. Exactly. That, those the two tension rollers, um, the or the planet what is it planetary roller and the tension rollers really helped with keeping things um, one in line because they each have a little lip on it and two mm -hmm. keeping things flat. Um, to the point where I was able to go without glass for in many reels on the and top. And if you can go without glass in any case with these, yeah. especially with older reels, you should absolutely attempt that. Yeah. Um, the film has another... a lot of gunk sometimes. There's a lot of uh, oozing ruby lift tape uh, and some other things that just cause problems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, you know, if you can go without the top glass, you really, really save yourself a lot of heartache and you kind of increase your productivity um, by a great deal. Um, the less you have to clean the glass, the, yeah. the better. Again, nothing that'll surprise any of the photographers that are listening right now. All right, so we've talked about a lot of this, but why real top? So all the pressure is adjustable. Uh, and so it's a much better kind of preservation tool uh, than anything that we home grew. Uh, the components don't shift or move once set. Uh, if you go back a little bit, um, all the way back here, uh, you'll notice that on both of the home grown rigs, uh, basically our real loader solution is just a piece of rebar that runs through the reel. And of course that shimmies a little bit. We can lock that down a little bit with some clamps, but um, it's nothing compared to actually having um, these advanceable uh, basically these tensioned reel holders on either side and both of those like i said both of those are removable so if you get something that's tail out you can advance completely to the other reel and um flip if you need to so that you have access to the closest handle or start shooting. on the right and go left yep which exactly. is an issue but it can be done it can absolutely be done uh, another thing that's worth mentioning here uh, it's easily removable from the Atom system. So if you have a couple of projects going on and you have an Atom station and you have to remove, uh, say you have to do reflective for a little while and you have to put your uh, aerial project on hold, you can just take mm -hmm. the whole whole top off with the reels on it, put it to the side, put your new top on and continue. Um, it's versatile for different film conditions. Yesterday, I was working with another one of our wonderful digital imaging specialists, Anastasia Paley, and uh, we got a film that had, uh, we got a reel that was very, very badly damaged from vinegar syndrome, um, basically um, creeping ruby lift tape, 
uh, and there had been mold damage. Uh, and all mm. of that kind of combined, and I believe it was from 1943, all of that combined uh, to making some of the film extremely brittle while making other parts of the film completely fused to other frames. Uh, and so uh, Anastasia and I were able to, by loading it onto the reel top, very, very carefully advance it with two people. Um, and I was on one side, uh, gently cleaning off uh, with a little bit of PEC-13 and doing very, very gentle separation with a medical spatula. And we were able to get a shot of every frame on that reel, despite the fact that it was basically fused to itself and brittle for 150 frames. Oh, that's, um, yeah. I've had actually the emotion, some of that stuff where when you're advancing it, the it's so stuck together. The, you can hear the emotion just ripping off and yep. you get huge blank pat patches mm. yeah. and you just have to stop. Um, Ty, Ty, yeah. and, Ty and Jennifer, just, a, just yes. a quick heads up. You've got about three or four minutes left. So. Okay. 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 Um, so let's just jump forward. Uh, out of these and ongoing challenges, frame sequence for spliced reels, sometimes in copy reels, it goes back and forth. Um, basically, we make a decision at the beginning and stick with it. We don't adjust the real or in, uh, the real counter order. Um, part of that is because we've seen the flight plans that get made from these, and the numbering order may kind of be in reference to the flight paths. You'll notice that some of these numbers are running down top to bottom, and some of these numbers are running up top to bottom. Uh, we also have three quarter flyover shots, which uh, film orientation it basically tells you. Well, you can see the horizon. You know exactly how to orient that regardless of the uh, instruments. Uh, notes in a red between frames, that's something that we mentioned before. Um, we like to expand uh, the glass whenever we can so we can catch that errata and have a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, operator repetitive stress. Uh, one of the ways that we kind of worked on that and Jen was the first one to experience it is we put a little bit of foam on the handles. The handles on the real top are already designed to be comfortable. Uh, but we made them a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more chunky, and that tends to help because you're not squeezing with your fingers quite as hard. Uh, splices, glue, and glass cleaning, which when we, we got the real top, I just wanted to say when we got the real yeah. top, I was shooting one reel a day. When we got the real top, I was able to go up to two reels, possibly two and a half or three reels a day. So the repetitive stress did start to occur, and um, so I had. Basically, you can get into some bad habits without knowing. And Ty noticed how I was holding my hands and everything, and my wrists were bending. So it, it's something to keep an eye on when you you're able to increase your um, workflow. All the, that's happened to me before. Uh, so it's it was nice to have someone to look at and see what I was doing wrong. But it's also great, and it feels great to get so much done in one day. It it really really does. One minute, March. Let's jump ahead yep. to our results. All right. So our output increased 300% since the introduction of the real top. Truth be told, since the beginning of the project, we've actually increased production by about 800%. But when you factor out the extra man hours that we put on and the extra seats, uh, real top itself alone is about 300% increase. Mm -hmm. We've got 117,000 frames captured to date. And we started out capturing about 3,000 frames per month. We're up to 25,000 frames per month now. Um, and Let's see, homemade rigs are idiosyncratic. Um, we still keep them on just to increase the number of seats while we kind of get our budget lines for more real tops. Um, but it takes about one to two weeks of learning delay because things shift around and you basically have to get used to not just paying attention to your film, but paying attention to your rig in a way you don't have to with the real top. Um, pretty much any operator um, can attest that they're comfortable on the real top. Um, I'm comfortable putting anybody on it and the learning curve is only about several hours to two days compared to one to two weeks on something that we've built ourselves. Um, any questions? I, I'm just coming in. All right. uh, Ty and Jennifer, thank you uh, for the presentation. It's absolutely great. Um, I do I do have a, a request. Uh, make I want to make sure that uh, our Nob Chatterjee, our product uh, product manager, gets more data points on on those handles and, and your adaptation, because as I indicated earlier before, we, we always want to improve upon our products. So um, Anab, I know you're out there somewhere. Make sure that uh, you reach out to these folks to get some more data points, please. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And the only other thing that we would really request as as an augmentation to the the real top version two um, is a little bit wider glass on the glass stage. We might not be mm -hmm. shooting that whole area, um, but it's nice to have the wiggle room on either side. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. For me, it's a little more depth. I'd love more than a, more than the nine inch that we have, but that's mm -hmm. only because I run into ten by ten aerial transparencies. Gotcha. I have to take the roof gotcha. off. But yeah. a whole other story. Yeah. Yep. All right. That's great. Great information. Thank you. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank you. Well, Thanks for having us. Let's see the questions. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. Did we capture a single shot or did we stitch? Uh, we captured single shot. Mm -hmm. We're not stitching anything. Um, and so, as we mentioned before, we're really, really pushing um, the limits of the frame with the IXGs um, at 900 PPI, but with the IXH, we have a significant amount more latitude. Um, we haven't, we just got our IXH. And so we're not really, we haven't really put it through its paces of what we need to do. And we're keeping things consistent, but we know that we'll be able to do a lot more in the future. Um, the disposition of the imagery. Uh, could you uh, elaborate that on a little bit, a little bit more, Tom, regarding the disposition? Is that exactly what you mean? Ah, yes, um, yes, it's going to go. It goes back to DoD on a regular basis as we finish it. Um, a lot of things from this collection may be candidates for inclusion in the USCDL, but we'll have to talk to our subject experts and see what's of interest to them. Uh, so we probably won't be taking it all on, but basically everything that's being done by still uh, is unclassified and is in public domain at this point. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, but it, a lot of it does have very, very bad vinegar syndrome. So we're not really that keen on keeping it around longer than we have to. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, we don't really have to clean up dust after capture. Sometimes uh, if you noted the, the lettering that is on the actual uh, frame area on the actual image, uh, that is imprinted after the fact. You can feel it when, you're, when you touch the uh, base side. So sometimes that chips off. But generally, there's there's not a lot of dust coming off of it, basically. But there is a lot of dust because it wasn't stored in a controlled facility. It was basically in a warehouse. So, and that's probably where it's going back. So, sorry, I just grabbed a reel regarding the film stock. Oh, most of the film stock that we've got uh, in this is the nine and a half inch Kodak, nine and a half inch by five hundred, or nine and a half inch by three hundred. Um, and basically we didn't get anything that was nitrate, um, basically because we're not prepared to handle it carefully at this volume. I mean, mm -hmm. we can handle nitrate occasionally for smaller projects. Uh, so anything that was nitrate was copied over onto the Kodak reels. Um, and of course we had a little bit of a shock at one point when we looked at it and we said, oh, this film says nitrate. And then we realized that, um, the reference that yeah. says nitrate is out of focus and it was copy film and it was basically yeah. those exposures have been copied to a larger reel like this that are 500 frames plus and sometimes it's crooked which confuses you yes <laughs> if that's you're another not reason shot it <laughs> that's another big reason for having the shoot sheets when you have multiple operators and multiple people doing post it's really really good to have a reference to see oh okay this wasn't an operator error this is actually how the film uh, exists in the real world. It wasn't, you know, Jen didn't make a frame crooked or overexpose something. Right. Um, something we also didn't mention is we really, really like, we use it sparingly, but the uh, high dynamic range feature in Capture One Pro, in Capture One Cultural Heritage, yeah. um, is really, really useful for blown out yeah. exposures on the frames. We can usually pull out useful detail and information with that. Yeah, um, but for most of the frames we don't the frame use. Frame is fine, but the the uh, dials are blown out, so that can help a lot with bringing up the dials just a little bit, or uh, that little bit of detail that it's in the blown out white that you get if you pull it a little bit. So, mm -hmm. so for the glass that we're using, um, 
we're using water glass for the under, uh, for the bottom glass. The top glass is anti-Newton glass because you can't sandwich without getting those microscopic air channels. And we want to make sure that we don't have those. Ah. Um, let's see. Uh, I can answer Doug's. Um, Go yeah, for it. They haven't been stored. We have not had any, ha well, other than the smell of the vinegar syndrome, which we've actually had tested, it actually seeped from our area through the entire floor one day and everyone was wondering what was going on. Um, and they finally figured it was us, so they moved us <laughs> so that we wouldn't make the whole building smell. Yeah, and we, we, but, and we have um, a rotation around that too. So yeah. we have a mixture of frame of reels that are in better condition versus uh, frames that are in poorer condition. Yeah. And I try not to ask anybody on the team to do more than a reel or two of the really, really bad vinegar syndrome. We also have respirators for people that are sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning that our environmental safety team came in and measured everything. And even though you can detect um, the particulate from the vinegar syndrome and it smells like salad dressing, it's not actually harmful at the concentrations that we had, but people are just alarmed by the smell. Yeah. Um, but it's worth mentioning we have respirators for for operators that are sensitive to it and i we will mix reels so we'll mix a more contemporary reel with an older reel and get boxes done that way yeah. uh, we'll also air them out but there's a sweet spot for airing them out unless you have a humidity controlled environment because the film with vinegar syndrome will pull humidity from the room um, and actually it'll briefly get easier to work with and then get much harder to work with if you leave it out too long Right. Let's see. Um, so I, I have a I have a, a quick question uh, for for both Ty and, and Jennifer. Um, when as part of your 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 I guess capture process, how do you determine optimal exposure? Are you using like uh, densitometers? You visual? You look at a histogram? Um, what's your what's your method? Personally, I uh, I do look at the histogram, but I do the old fashioned method where I do a couple of tests. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of go, okay, so which is the good one? Okay, yeah, I like that exposure. However, your exposure on the first 10 frames could be completely different. Than mm -hmm. the last one. We have everything from bulletproof to window panes on these okay. exposures. So um, sometimes I'll ch I try not to because it's faster to do post if everything is consistent. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I will change the exposure mid 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 reel if i have to i'll open it up or close it down if it's significant enough if it's a stop no because capture one can do it it's not a big deal um yeah. sometimes and even sometimes if it's more than that i'll let it go it just also depends on how many is it five frames you know and you never know we don't see these reels unless we pre-roll them onto another reel we don't see anything before we shoot it okay. so it's kind of an yeah. unknown thing yeah, I was under the assumption that each reel would be just basically a series. So you kind of set up the primary exposure and you'd run through it. But it sounds like it can be, but it's not always. Always. Yeah. A lot of times yeah. a lot of times this film is actually a copy of a copy because you'll see different um I can tell by the uh the dials and the registrations and the film types, it's they've been either spliced together or copied on the mm -hmm. film. And um, there was another question about scratches and everything from the cloth. And these, this one's already scratched. There are scratches running through this film, some visible, some not. Um, I do worry about it and we try to clean, the, clean everything, but it, it, it's not gonna make a difference if there's one little scratch. So, and usually it's um, not on our part. Thank you. We, we probably have time for one more question if someone else has uh, a question I'd like to ask. Um, so let's just, let's just wait a sec. Um, there was one from Alex, I think, or is that someone's um, question? There's, there's an Aiden. Um, I might be able to wrap in five. Three. Um, I'm going to go across with gentle separation first. When we start doing manual separation in a concerted way, that's usually a last ditch attempt to save what we can. Um, basically, if you want uh, it to separate uh, when it's really fused together, if it's not ruby lift glue, um that's doing it um putting it in a slightly higher humidity environment usually cause it to become a little bit more pliable and more um amenable to separating mm -hmm. um 
but beyond that, once you start going in with a medical spatula, you're really doing the last that you can do. Um, mm -hmm. And let's see, um, so I had to go to 900 PPI. That was a speed thing. Um, camera capture uh, at 900 PPI, like I said, we're squeezing out. We can go probably a little bit higher with the IXH, but we only mm -hmm. just recently acquired that. When I did and the testing, I was going to say, when I did the testing, I gave the DOD uh, a number of different resolutions and variety of, of images mm -hmm. to choose from, and they chose the highest of the highest of the highest. So. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it looks like Kate is rem uh, reminding folks that you can email us, and indeed you can. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody's had a chance to, mm -hmm. to catch our emails. Please feel free to email both of us with any questions you might have. Um, we're more than happy. There's so much more information around all of this and it develops every day. So um, we're happy to be a resource to anybody curious. And I'm still waiting to see a crop circle. I have yet to see a crop circle. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some wonderful imagery, but no crop circles. Uh, awesome. Yet. <clears throat> well, Ty and Jennifer, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. It was really, really fascinating. and all the great work you guys are doing.